Well, here we are in uh, LBI, uh, the Surf City Library. We are. Whilst the Lighthouse International Film Festival takes place behind us or That's true. Among, around amid, us. Amidst us. Around amidst, 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 our, us. amidst, amidst us. Yes. <laughs> This is uh, it's a long time coming, Gary Springer. Uh, you have avoided this show for years <laughs> successfully. Well, I've given you people over the years. You've given me not only people, but you've given me some of the best people, I might add, most, most notably Lee Ullman, who you just saw the other day. Who I just saw the other day. And uh, it was interesting. Yesterday, uh-huh. I was uh, doing a talk down here at the uh, Lighthouse <laughs> International Film Festival. Uh, Not just on a my talk. life, yeah, and, yeah. And uh, part of it, uh, there's a, a a slide of Leave and my dad. Uh, later on, there's a slide of me and Leave, but uh, you know, and I showed that it was 1966. Yeah, I get, get, get Nick and Leave. 1966 with Persona, mm-hmm. and and literally the man who was taping my speech was using my phone, and all of a sudden he said, uh, "Excuse me, you have a phone call," and I said, "Just just keep taping through it; it'll be fine." He said, "But it's." Lee Volman. <laughs> it's edited on the phone, right? Like yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty. I know that is that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's getting an incoming. I, and call. then I told everybody I did not pay her to call me at this time. I did not ask her to give me a call. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Well, that's even the more the mark of a uh, somebody who's r- highly connected. That's true. I don't remember other people at the, off the top of my head right now, but that was a, it's still much appreciated because she was such a, a sweetheart, as I knew she would be. If well, then we did the Vera Formiga. And, oh, right, of and course. The whole boundary, of Peter course. Fonda, that whole crew. Down That's in, right. Well, I didn't get Peter. It, oh, you didn't get Peter? No, I would have. I, I did not get Peter Fonda. Ah. But I got. I got just about everybody else in that group. Why didn't I? I didn't. Know oh, you Peter know what? Was Peter Fonda didn't come. To he didn't. He didn't West. go. Okay, no. well, that that makes me feel a little bit better, like or less frustrated because. But I mean, still Vera Formiga. You and uh, what's the name of the director of, the, of Sean uh, Boundary? Fest. That's right. Yeah, no, I mean, to have gotten... Well, first of all, it was really fun to watch those scenes with, with Peter Fonda and Christopher Plummer. But uh, anyway, th- I enjoyed this, those scenes with Peter. But, but, but uh, wow, to get Peter Fonda would be another high point for me. Yeah, well, That's, you know, and, and uh, my history with Peter goes back... Well, it goes back a lot longer with Hank. But with Peter to 1965, when my mom and dad took my sisters and I to California for the first time to Los Angeles... And we went to uh, Malibu or one of the beach towns where Fonda had a house. And I just remember um, flying kites with Peter Fonda on the beach when I was 11 years old. So this is this is our history goes back a bit. Yeah, this is essentially why you're you, you don't want to talk to you because your dad was a famous publicist. Mm-hmm. His name was uh, John Ma- Maury uh, Springer. <laughs> no, John Springer. John Springer. Uh, and hand, uh, just name some of the, the people that he handled, uh, most of which you obviously interacted with, because your well, dad had to uh, be a really nice guy because he had really personal, deeply personal relations, it sounds like, with a lot of his clients. He was, you know, deeply personal relations. And, uh, you know, what I was uh, saying when my dad died, uh, I believe it was either Variety or the L.A. Times, I can't remember, but it said... Uh, he was the last gentleman in a business with very few gentlemen. Mm. And that's one reason everybody liked him. I mean, one of the things that my dad did was keep people out of the press. I mean, he represented Marilyn Monroe. He represented Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. I'm not he, familiar with these people. Yeah, but, they, uh, they, they were, they're, you know, minor stars. Small time minor actors. actors. Yeah, yeah, minor yeah. actors. Yeah. Big um, players. He started, his, he started his business. I think his first five clients, or five or six clients, were Richard Burton, Tony Randall. Sylvia Sidney, Warren Beatty, Myrna Loy, Robert Preston, <laughs> and that's how he started his business. It was Burton who that made him like, do it because right. he was he was uh, at one point he had his own company with uh, a man named Arthur Jacobs who was in L.A. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Arthur left to become a movie producer, produced things like Around the World in Eighty Days, Doctor Doolittle, Planet of the Apes. Um, no, I lied. He didn't do Around the World in Eighty Days. That was Mike Todd. He did uh, Doctor Doolittle and Planet of the Apes. Uh, well, like both, both. Uh, r- and my dad, uh, when 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 they kind of dissolved, decided he didn't want to keep it going, and mm-hmm. um, went to work for Rogers and Cowan, which is another PR firm, is ran the New York office. Uh, but then when Richard Burton came into town to do, I believe it was either Camelot or Hamlet, he said, "Oh, love, I, I'm not with that lot. Uh, you can do it on your own, John." And so that's how my father started. His Burton kind of started him. And oh, he, wow. 
But by the way, I want to mention one thing about Richard Burton, uh, which you know, of course, was one of the most famous film and stage actors uh, ever, an enormous talent. He had some demons of his own, but he talks about there's a YouTube clip. I'm trying to remember the talk show he was on, but he talks about alcoholism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gonna uh, play. I'm gonna. I might put it in at the end of this segment, uh, just uh, that clip because I, I'm referring to it, where he talks about the stranglehold that uh, that alcohol gets on you. What what just what? It's one of the most articulate. He gets so intense. It's it's about it and so open and honest. It's an incredible. Spoiler. Oh well, he was very open. I mean, oh, but all of these guys were Peter O'Toole, George yeah. C. Scott. I mean, and I've worked with all of them, and yeah. they were all. I mean, you I, worked I, with I, all of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I. Uh, um, and they, but finish your thought. Please. And and you know, alcohol was a major major part of their lives. Right. And back then, before everything was so PC. Yes. They really didn't hide it. Everybody knew that Richard drank all the time. Everybody knew, you know, I mean, Richard drank, uh, I, I think when he was doing Hamlet, somebody, I'd read someplace, he would have like a, a, a bottle of vodka in the, during the day, and then he would be good for the first act, and then from the intermission to the end of the show, it would be every time he'd walk off stage, his valet would be there with a no. schooner of vodka. Yeah. George C. Scott, the same. I, I worked, um, did Inherit the Wind with George C. Scott. And George would drink beer most of the day and then start drinking vodka before the performance. Uh, we did an interview with the New York Times with Peter Marks. And we were uh, at Sam's opposite the Golden Theater on 45th Street. And Peter and I were there and we each had a beer and, and you know, some more or something. George walks in. Uh, they just bring over a water goblet full of vodka and a beer. George downs both of them. Then they bring over another one. He downs the water goblet full of vodka and half the beer and then says, well, I have to go and uh, do the show now. Peter Mark said to me, runs to a, uh, a pay phone because this was when pay phones were still everywhere and calls the Times and has them cancel his appointment that night. And we went and stood in the back of the house and it was one of the most electrifying performances I have ever seen in my life. And they functioned. You know, and, and but Richard was, you know, they were very open about it, too. Well, I wonder if if, if they did that in order to function uh, at t- like if, if their top, you know, uh, level, in other words, that it 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 was it was a calm their nerves or whatever version of, that they rationalized it, but right. that it helped them be on. Uh, and they know. were on. And uh, I mean, well. you know, again, Richard in. In, in Hamlet, in, in, in Camelot, in Hamlet, you know, Scott and in, in, in half the things he did, Peter O'Toole, they were all very big drinkers and, Martin, you know, many more than that because back then it was kind of more commonplace. Sure. Now it's so PC to be not. Not, you not know, Richard you, Harris. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> he, was, he was straight. <laughs> the gang, the gang. Yeah, right. He was part of that, uh, that uh, gang of uh, actors of the great time, right? But, I mean, magnificent actors. Yeah. Magnificent. Oh, the best. Yeah. The best. You've just mentioned several of my favorite uh, actors, for sure. But let me, when was this, in, you were, if not a child actor, essentially you were, you came out, you were barely out of your childhood when you started professionally acting, right? You, so you, well, this I, is I, an earlier chapter. You know, was that I your dad really again? I really wanted or? to be an actor. It was I, your dad? I was, hmm? It was your dad? No, that he was, didn't want to be an actor. No, no, no. But oh. he was. No, 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 no. Gave you the opportunities, or no? Um, um, I, I was kind of a. a I, I had always worked in his office on like summers and weekends. Sure. And, you know, especially when before the New York Film Festival, when they're all you know back then, it was all the old mimeograph machines and collating releases. Yeah. And, sure. So I would I would spend time working in my dad's office. Um, uh, and I also wasn't the best student at all. In in four years of high school, I went to three different. No, I went to four years, four different high schools. Three of them in the first two years of high school. So uh, you know, I just never really found school well, to be. Well, you working. didn't explain why. So I get why were you switching high schools? Oh, I don't know. Just because I you failed out or just no, I didn't feel out, fail out. I just didn't like it. You know, and and wanted to go someplace else, and then someplace else. And you had that option. But I wound up private. I wound up at a school, um, upstate New York, called Storm King, which is near West Point. And 
I wasn't crazy about that either. And then a friend of mine uh, who I had known from one of my other schools said, you know, you really should get involved in the theater program because, first of all, then we don't have curfew and we can always go out. We always sit together and drink wine or, you know, smoke weed or whatever uh, after that. So I said, okay. Um, Not that I, again, really wanted to be an actor, but I started doing the school plays and doing that. And then uh, in my senior year, so this was 1971, 72. Yeah. I went to a party with my parents. It was a New Year's Eve party that David Newman and Bob Benton were ha- uh, having. And, of course, they wrote Bonnie and Clyde. And then, um, you know, Benton went on to do Kramer versus Kramer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I was talking to a guy, uh, a Czech filmmaker named Yvonne Passer. And we were just talking, you know, about what I was doing. And I was telling him I was, you know, in the school play or something of the sort. And about three or four weeks later, my father calls up and says, you know, Yvonne Passer would like to give you a call. Uh, I said, well, you can call me on Sunday at the Doormaster's house. I gave him the number, and the following Sunday he called up and said, you know, I'm doing a movie, and you have a very interesting quality, and um, I'd love for you to be in it. I said, well, but I'm not an actor. And he says, well, I thought you were doing the plays at school. He said, well, that's school plays. It's just so I can get out of curfew. (laughs) Uh, And he said, no, no, you'll be fine, I think. You'll be fine. The movie's with Carol O'Connor and Ernest Borgnine, and we're going to be shooting during the summer. That well, seems very uh, redundant. What, the two of them? <laughs> yeah. But so I said, well, fine, uh, okay. So uh, summer comes, I graduate from, from, from school, and the teacher, when we were doing We Bombed in New Haven, which was the play I was doing at the time I talked to Yvonne, which is a Joseph Heller play that he wrote right before he did Catch-22. Uh, but it's the same thing. It's anti-authority, it's military. He did it, it was 1972, remember, so it was all surrealistic, it was all black, everybody was in black turtlenecks and sweats, except for the idiots. And the idiot was one of the characters that I played in the school play. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're like the Greek chorus, whenever the people get antsy. So he asked, he said, look, I'm going to be leaving school and mounting this play off Broadway, and I'd like you to be in it. Basically, so he could get my dad to do the press for it, but, you know. Whatever. Whatever. So here I am, 17 years old. I already knew I'm going to be doing the movie in August, September, and so I wasn't going to go to college till January. Um, so I was doing this off-Broadway play, and for the first four performances, I've never acted or, or you know, right. professionally before, I was totally nude on stage uh, for the entire show. Wow. I, I had a pale, pale blue body makeup with blood streaming up my face and, you know, my leg was like all well, tattered with blood. And this is the Heller play. This is the Joseph Heller yeah. play. Remember, it is 1972. Oh yes. Um, and, and 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 then I did the movie and the 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 passer film, the passer the passer movie yeah. and you know Borgnine and O'Connor were auxiliary cops, and I was a street punk smoking a joint that they find right. and they try to arrest me and I have four scenes. They bring me to the precinct and you know this and that and all I say throughout the entire movie about thirteen times is. You <laughs> like and that? That was my billing. I was billed as the fu kid. What was? Uh, where was that shot? Uh, the Lower East Side. Like we we shot um, Grand Street um, uh, over by you know yeah. the ABCs. We shot on we shot on uh, a bar uh, on Fifth and B, which is where the Hell's Angels were. You know, and the Hell's Angels were there at the time because their clubhouse was like Fifth. You know, between on B between Fourth and Fifth. Mm-hmm. And so they were kind of looking after us. Yeah, this. But yes, all I say throughout the there. entire movie is "fuck you." And I'd walk down the street, and people would say, "Hey, fuck you," and walk away. And then I went to college, and I got up there, and they said, "Oh, it's the New York fucking actor." So I immediately shut down and decided, I'm, "Okay, I'm going to go to Hunter. I'll go back and mm-hmm. you know uh, back to the city." And the following May, uh, mm-hmm. that May, uh, the casting director, we had a um, cast and crew screening of Law and Disorder. And they said, you know, you were pretty good in this. Who's your agent? I said, well, I don't have an agent. I'm going to go to college and figure out what I'm going to do. They said, well, we're doing another movie. You should come down and try out for it. And I did. And that was Dog Day Afternoon. And I played Al Pacino and John Cazale's partner. Um, I chicken out of the bank. And all of a sudden, I wound up getting an agent, wound up going to Hollywood and spending the next 10 years yeah. in, in L.A. All right, but hold on a second. So now you're in a movie with Al Pacino. 
what had he done before that he did? Uh, Serpico. He, well, he had a theater background already, established as a New York actor. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, well before that. The, so Indian, uh, the Indian. Once the Bronx. Once the Bronx. And then he did, uh, yeah. So he, that was Panic in Needle Park. Right. And the he Godfather. Did that, he had he, just done The Godfather did, did, right was that before out? Dog Day. Okay. And then he also did, uh, what was the one with uh, Gene Hackman? Uh, the Conversation? No, 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 no. No, that was, no well, both of them were in it. Ooh. They were... Br- was also, I think it was also uh, same director as uh, Panic. Uh, who Not I Serpico. No, 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 no. It was before that. Uh, it was uh, uh, anyway. Regardless. So, so you're on the set. You're uh, Sidney Lumet. Yeah. Who was brilliant? Al Pacino. Yeah. John Cazale. The late John, John Cazale, Cazale. The late the John great, Cazale. Who every movie he was in was Oscar nominated. Five movies, and All every one of them nominated. was nominated for Best Picture. You figure out why, right? Is the question to the audience. You you put it together. Yeah. <laughs> Why Watch that? those movies and you'll see one you know a yes. solidly all throughout. I right. mean, you know, mm-hmm. everybody remembers him as Fredo in The Godfather and Godfather 2 as well. Yeah. But and you mentioned the go- you mentioned the conversation a second ago and I mean, I think he's tremendous in that. Yeah. Well. Oh, absolutely. And <laughs> and, uh, and Dog Day After The Deer Hunter. Right. You know. Yeah. He was dating uh Meryl. Meryl Streep. Right? They were the item. So how long were you on that set? The well, I was only I only worked like four days, okay. um, but I was there a lot because you know I just wound up. I just loved being there. Why just, wouldn't you? You know, I wasn't like Shot a in professional Brooklyn? actor who came and did my stuff. I mean, I was. This is all still new to me. I mean, yeah. and now you, the stakes were much higher, uh, right? Because it was a real Hollywood. Oh yeah, this is a this is a big movie. I mean, um, you know, there was it was. There was a gentleman today, Jerry Levine, who was with Born on the Fourth of July. Yeah, I met him. Who yeah. was talking about how um, you know the length of movies, and they're all talking about all these movies are taking eighteen days, twenty days if, if, um, for a good film, twenty something. Yeah, right. Dog Day, I think, was about we rehearsed for like three weeks, uh, you know, in the old Ansonia Hotel on Broadway and Seventy Third sure, Street. Sure. Um, uh, they drew out the bank, and you know, it was a regular, you know, full theater rehearsal practically. And then the shoot went on a lot longer than 20 days. Um, they don't do that. I also did another film. Well, you said Jaws 2. I was in Jaws 2, and, and that was 11 months. That's bizarre. That's just hysterical. But that you also know? shows how huge Jaws was. Another, another Oh, yeah. Movie, like that they, they could devote 11 months to a... If a, it was a, the first Jaws, they wouldn't recycled, have never let it go 11 months. Yeah, which was essentially the, the mimeograph machine again yeah. of, 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 of the original Jaws. Yeah. Jaws 2 is as close a ripoff of the Jaws, original. Well, Jaws, Jaws 2 got... Uh, it, it actually did very well. Jaws oh, I'm 3 sure and 4 were well. ridiculous. No, no, of, it did very well. Well, but you had Roy Scheider still. And yeah. You had, you know, an, oh, and yeah, it was and Lorraine it was Gary. It was Roy it, Scheider. It was right. Jeffrey Kramer playing the deputy again. Right. Uh, so you had the same. You know, it was Mary Hamilton playing the mayor. Same course step, same setup. So, nah, they let them on the beach. Let them play, you know, the same yeah. exactly. And it was just the, uh, the 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 wife of the original shark or something. It was like kind no, of. No, 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 no. It was the cousin, <laughs> I think. We said it was the cousin. <laughs> All right. Well, let's not. Jump the shark, because <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about dog. I just want to know you, you. You know, one of the things that I was looking forward to talk to you is getting any kind of colorful anecdotes and you, anecdotes. And you've already surpassed already with with good stories. But uh, I, I just didn't know if there was anything uh, particularly memorable working with Al Pacino. Who, well, I and, mean, it was Cindy just Lumet, you know, working with with. Borgnine and O'Connor was oh, yeah. was should... just kind of fun. I was I mean I was brand new to this. It wasn't like I had that was before... trained or thought about it. Was that I just before... he had probably almost he probably was just before he got uh, All in the Family. I'm guessing. Cause... Oh no, he was doing All in the Family. He was already doing. Yeah, it. he was already okay. doing All in the Family. Because that was '68, I think, right? Yeah, was... Uh, probably, but this was seventy. And you were, it was already in the 70s. Oh, so oh yeah. This was, yeah, when, when we were doing this. Oh, all right. So it was already, um, so it all the family had been on for a while. Yeah, it may have been a but, little later, but, but yeah. But, you know, I was I was just so new to it. It was just so much fun. I was just playing, I'm, you know, yeah. being out on the street. I mean, you know, because I had to smoke a joint and then right. put it in my mouth and then take it out when Borgnine turns around and smoke it again. And then he runs up to me and I had to swallow it. Can you with see a, this film with anywhere? A billy Club, open your oh. mouth, open your mouth. And oh, that's wow. when I go, "Fuck you!" So between every take, we were shooting it at a bodega. People yeah. were walking up, going, "What are you smoking there?" And they handed me joints. Uh, the, the the lady upstairs was leaning out of her, you know, sitting on the yes. fire escape, dropping me beers. <laughs> you know, hey, clean your mouth out, clean your mouth out. I'm having a great time. But I'm then sure working it was with like Sydney the East Village Pacino, in the seventies. Yeah. This was real movie stuff. This right. was, you know, this was. But Borgnine also nice guy. Borgnine. 
Borgnine was a great guy. Borgnine was a great guy. As, as 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 was Carol. I didn't have as much to do with Carol. Yeah. And and actually, the the end of the movie, my last scene with them is they see me in a phone booth after their you know self dignity had been trashed and they were just building up their self respect again. Mm-hmm. Um, and Borgnine goes, "Ooh, watch, watch!" And he walks over and he goes, "Hey, kid, how do you get to the Statue of Liberty?" And I look at him. I go, "Fuck you!" And then Borgnine. Then then they were trying to figure out how to do what to do to me. And finally, O'Connor just said, enough, enough. I'm just going to walk up and say, what did you say to my friend? Fuck you. Good. Boom. And he knocks me through the phone booth. So he, you know, yeah. he made the quick decision. But uh, 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 but they were both great. Uh, that's good to hear. I, I assumed as much. But is yeah. it, um, they wouldn't have agreed to do such a small movie if they weren't already kind of open and artistically committed and all that stuff. I mean, you know, they've yeah. had big careers. Uh, w- w- uh is that what's the name of that one again? Law and Disorder. Law and, and can, can, how do you find it? Can you? Oh yeah, you can find. It. I mean, I is it? You know, I found a DVD when Blockbuster was still alive. I found a DVD in mm-hmm. in you know their five dollar bin one day. Right. And, I, I, you know, <laughs> which was which was nice. My to career, have. my acting career is in a five dollar bin at yeah, the exactly. at Blockbuster. Hey, hey, no, I did another movie. Um, but Dog uh, Day Afternoon. After, after I did, nobody can ever. After I did that. Jaws two. Yeah. Um, it was called uh, Hometown USA. And I was the star. I was starring Gary Springer, Max Baer, uh, Jethro and the Beverly Hillbillies directed right. it. Sure. Play, and he played it was Jethro? basically a ripoff of American Graffiti. Okay. Um, I think I w- actually wore the same virtual same costume that Dreyfus did in America. You know, that plaid shirt with the chinos. And, right. And, um, uh, but it opened. Its world premiere was on Hollywood Boulevard at the World Cinema. I think it was the World Cinema for $2. So that was, you know, yes. That's kind of like the five dollar bin. In, in the, oh, I see. Well, yeah. Did you have the curl, the curl in the front? And the... Oh yeah, yeah. Although Elizabeth Taylor, Elizabeth Taylor sent my dad a, a, a picture because, as I mentioned, my dad, uh, you know, handled her. best friends with Henry Fonda. Uh, and when I thought that was Jimmy Stewart. When Elizabeth was down in in Virginia, living with uh, the senator. Uh, she sent my dad a picture, and it was a drive-in just down the street from their house. It was Gary Springer in Hometown USA, also Jay Fonda in The China Syndrome. <laughs> and she wrote, and she said, see whose kid has more clout? Right. That's funny. All right. If I said it once, it's said Hunter Stein's first puppet show, then Spinal. I mean, first Spinal Tap, then Puppet yeah. Show. Remember that line? <laughs> um Oh, so it came out in this like seventy six, seventy seven. But uh, was Chinatown seventy eight, I think it came okay. out. Yeah, Chinatown would have been right around 78. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and then okay, but regardless of hometown USA, hometown and, USA, and, yeah. and 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 Law and Disorder, you, you no one could ever take away the uh, Dog Day Afternoon. No, Dog Day That's Afternoon a was a, a, huge, a, a brilliant movie, and I you're mean, you've got a real it, it memorable was, it was part in that. Probably. I mean, I feel it should have won the Academy Award over Cuckoo's Nest because Cuckoo's Nest was fun, but it was... I mean, you never see Cuckoo's Nest. It just doesn't translate and play. Well, Dog Day, you see all the time because it does play and it does work and well, people do get it. I don't... I mean, Cuckoo's Nest was a phenomenon, to... you know, but it was also... That's what Dog Day lost to at the Academy Awards that year. Right. Well, when Louise Fletcher won, right? Yeah, I don't know what, what there was behind that. Maybe because it was a... I don't know. Jack Nicholson can't can't argue he was amazing in that very different than Al Pacino and at the time it was the height of that New York actor right. Italian the ethnic actor movement where Dustin Hoffman Robert De Niro all those actors like you know even uh, uh, had Tony Lobianco on mm-hmm. uh, sometime recently on the show he's he was even in there he could have been he didn't rise to that level but he was he, oh, part yeah, of that no, group Tony, of New York Tony ethnic actors had a very solid career and, sure yeah yeah, yeah. and. Um, at least as Fiora LaGuardia and everything else. Which he's very good at. Yes, he is. His one man show. Yes. Um, so, anyway, so the any other. Uh, and Pacino, what was that? Was that well, expensive? again, I mean, Pacino was. He had scenes with him. Pacino was um, so very intense. You know, I mean, when we were rehearsing, I mean, he was fun. Yeah. But he was. He was uh, it's very, very focused. Very, very focused. Right. Um, Sidney Lumet, on the other hand, I mean, here's Sidney. You know, and this is I. This is when I actually decided I didn't want to be an actor. Oh. What I really want to do is go through the um, AD um, internship program, the Directors Guild. Really, I uh, had because I just loved the way the sets worked and the the camaraderie of the crew. Because a lot of the crew from Law and Disorder were also on Dog Day, 
But it was, you know, those yeah. New York crews were so, and I said, I don't want to be, I want to be one of the crew guys. So I was going to go through the AD program um, to, you know, to do that when Dog Day actually came out, uh, you know, and, and I right. got an agent and went to Hollywood. Right, yeah, you got, you know, it came so, out so big. So, so much for that. But um, uh, working with Sidney Lumet and working with, you know, uh, on the sets, I mean, there's, if you remember Dog Day, there's the whole sequence between the the local Italians and the, all the gays, because they all come out. The gay the, the gay guys oh. come out to when, when it finds Once out that they're televising. You know, he's 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 that is doing this for his gay lovers' sex right. change operation. Right. So I mean, there Stealing really were money, uh, uh, it, uh, robbing know, the bank. For, I'm sure we had yeah. extras, but it was really just all the locals mm -hmm. and the locals Sean and the Brooklyn, gays right? were fighting with each other. And there's Sidney Lumet. <laughs> on a stepladder in the middle of the street with a bullhorn going, all right, my little pussycats, now we have to behave. We have to shoot this, so we have to calm down. And it's just everybody did because yeah. that's the, the magnetism right. that Sydney had. Right, he had that power. Um, that was shot in Brooklyn, right? South Brooklyn. like uh, Prospect Park West. Oh, it was Prospect Park West? Yeah. Oh, yeah, wait. Okay, I got to uh, – yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that Banks – no, it wasn't a bank. We actually took over. Oh. Uh, it was an abandoned block. Oh. It was right by the Prospect Expressway, right. and it was there was hardly anything in the block, and we yep. took it over, and we, we built all that. Oh, wow. So they built the bank inside an old warehouse uh, that... Uh, and you know, ripped out the front, so all the glass, and but this way all the walls could come out and, and the tracking shots. And I mean, one of the great shots that I ever remember is when I walk into the bank... The, the camera follows me through the door, and they take him down the wall, and then it just goes all the way down past Al, who's filling out the thing, to Kazal, who opens up his briefcase and pulls out the machine gun. Right. And it was just a seamless shot of of, of the whole action. Right. You know, with me kicking off, walking through the door. Yes. That uh, is still when I see it, I get chills yeah. you know, of just remembering how well it was to have it done. Yeah. The f that was probably an example. The quickest case of. Uh, of Stockholm Syndrome in that movie yeah. because the women were all sort of seemed to support really, support su yeah right exactly he's our boy don't hurt him <laughs> yeah. I just love that movie Let's pause the film watch Dog Day Afternoon again because it's one of the great films of all, uh, certainly New York films of all time right yeah um, and so already you knew coming off of that that it wasn't necessarily your dream to be an actor but you did have a particular look and style that i can understand why it would be appealing to at that time especially you know yeah i mean i look i there never a number studied of character actors i never like studied i played myself very well yeah you know <laughs> that and, was a trick and had, so, a, and had a lot of fun doing it um right after we shot dog day in in november of 74 october november so dog day no uh, you know november it's cold in brooklyn and we're supposed to be in the dog days of august so we all had oh, to right. take ice right. and chew on ice before every scene that we were doing because otherwise we were vaporizing because it was so damn cold. Right. So your mouth had to be cold. So mm -hmm. there would be right. So there would be no Our contrast had to in be temperature. Cold so that we wouldn't wouldn't have a vaporize. contrast in temperature. Right, right, yes. Right. right. Yeah. That's right. But I then, heard about the opposite. So then too. the following the following year, I mean, I, again, I uh, dog day, and I had no real plans to you know I didn't have an agent. I wasn't planning on it. And then um, uh, the New York Film Festival, which my dad represented for 25 years, came along, and I worked on the festival, you know, as much as possible. It was one of the great experiences. I mean, you know, you've got Francois Truffaut, Eric Romer, Louis that, Mal, right. er, you know. Everybody from um, the world. Um, I remember one time I was standing outside of uh, Alice Tully Hall, and these two beautiful women walked by, and I, you know... And I was just kind of watching them, and then a few minutes Jean later, Jean and Catherine Deneuve. A few minutes later, they walk in, and it's Marie France PZA and. Uh, uh, um, I mean, tell me the movie, maybe. I... Marie France PZA. And, I don't know her. And she was in Tess. She she starred in Tess. not Natasha Kinski. Right, but obviously. Somebody. Else. Oh well. Anyway. Um, if you think and they, they walk in, and it was like you know, here I am, you know. Yes. 18, 18 year old kid. Oh, right. going, this is this is a I'm great place. Yeah. You know, hanging out with Louis Malle after Black Moon, which was one of the more unique movies I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I was there that year in seventy five, and and again waiting for March of seventy six, which is when the AD program was going to start. I see. And uh, Bill Barnes, who was the head of ICM, came up and said, "You know, I just saw a sneak of Dog Day Afternoon. You were very good in that. Who's your agent?" I said, well, "I don't have an agent." 
He said, well, you know, and I told him what I wanted to do. He said, well, you know, we could still send you out. You can make some money while, you mm-hmm. know, doing that. And I said, okay. So within three weeks, they got me a movie with Shelley Duvall oh, and yes. Bud Court and Dennis Christopher. This and is Veronica the short. Part, right? It was a, um, what a, great it was a, a one hour kind of um, Encyclopedia Britannica film for PBS. Oh, that's uh, why called it was Bernice that. Bernice Bobbs a, or Hair, which right. is an F. Scott Fitzgerald short story. Right. Which and is Joan Nicklin Silver directed it. Um, yeah. uh, of course, Joan did Hester Street, among other things. And Crossing Delancey. Crossing and, Delancey, and, yeah. Uh, and uh, was... so I did that, and Shelley and I became best friends. and. She knew I was I was now taking courses at Hunter, and I was going to do this thing in March. She said, well, you don't have to be back till February? And I said, no. She said, well, why don't you come out to L.A.? This was over Christmas vacation. She, she and her boyfriend, Patrick Reynolds, um, came. So I wound up moving out to California for a couple of weeks, and I wound up staying nine years. Wow. Uh, okay. So uh, 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 Bernice, Bob's right here? Is that yeah. Right? Which I one day, this is, was my introduction to you because I didn't associate having obviously seen Dog Day Afternoon at the very least uh, prior, I, but I didn't s- recognize you in that. Uh, but when I saw Bernice Bob's her hair, I said, "How do I know that? That uh, what's the cherubic face? That face? How do, <laughs> well, I, yeah. How do I know that? And so I looked at the and I looked." at the INDB and I was like Gary Springer and then of course you see it I was like and that's I think I emailed you immediately I'm like what the heck I didn't realize you were how I did not know I'm not sure but because that's my my period you know like um but then that was a period piece and um, 1919 yeah yeah and um so they were like flapper type of period of time right or just before the depression a bit before but Shelley Duvall became your, a close friend of yours. Yeah, well, I, I lived with Patrick and Shelley um, uh, in a castle overlooking what? Lake Hollywood, right by the Hollywood sign up in Beechwood Canyon, because Patrick was the heir to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Fortune. Oh. And they bought this house that was, um, it was built by the man who built Hollywoodland, but it looked, looked, looked like... Ludwig Hollywoodland was the name of Hollywood before Hollywood. Before Hollywood. They dropped but, yeah. the land, yeah. And and it looked like Ludwig of Bavaria's castle. If you've ever seen that, you know, that castle with all the turrets and everything. And it looked just like that in the middle of Hollywood and overlooking Lake Hollywood with a view of the whole city. Mm-hmm. And that's here I am again. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, 18, 19 years old going out to California for the first time. What did you think of your living life? Living in a castle with, right. with uh, Patrick and Shelley. And at one point, their relationship was getting a little tense. And it was good because I was kind of buffer between the t- the two of them, right? they went away to Europe um, to try and kind of work on the relationship for about a month. And so I had the house. I was a farmer, but we had five Great Danes. We had fish. We had birds. We had hermit On the property. And so here I am. I, you know, I had a uh, – Patrick left me with the Mercedes and a charge account at the at the Beachwood Market down, down in Beachwood Canyon. And that's, you know, kind of like wow. here all of a sudden I'm living in Hollywood. And uh, why should I go back to New York and go to Hunter? Uh, yeah, there's absolutely no mo- justification or motivation for leaving. But I also started working. I mean, right. um, three or four weeks after I was there, uh, um, I was at a uh, we had a party at the house, and and I was talking with Danny Selznick, um, mm-hmm. and David Danny, Selznick's mm-hmm, yeah son. son. So yeah. he was producing a a TV spot called Night Terror with Valerie oh, Harper. Cor- oh, okay. And um, uh, put me in it. So all of a sudden, I was there for like three weeks, and yep. I had. I was a I was a, a a mean gas station attendant who wouldn't give Valerie gas when she was running from somebody on the road, hence causing her to be in peril. Yes, right. I understand. But you know, I I kept on working, and I lived with them actually until July when their relationship kind of Fizzled. petered out. Yeah, and then Shelley and I um, moved uh, down to a place uh, in West Hollywood right. that Loretta Young had built uh, oh, wow. for her and her sister. And so it was a duplex. So I had half the house, yes. and Shelley had half the house. And then an, uh, uh, another friend came, Pat Ast, who was a, a Warhol actress. Mm-hmm. Uh, she came from New York and was living out there. So she, we were all living together. And then Shelley went to New York to um, do Annie Hall and called me one day and said, you know, I was with your sister at Elaine's and this, met this guy who said he was in the movie with me, and it was Paul Simon who was in Annie Hall with her, and she wound up selling the house and moving to New York and lived with Paul for two years. This is Shelley? Shelley Duvall. Oh, I didn't realize they were lovers for a while. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, you know, all of a sudden it was like, oh, my God, I'm on my own in Hollywood. <laughs> and I went from the castle to 
the Loretta Young house to a, 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 a couch in a gray apartment in North Hollywood. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, we'll say that's a, a scary. It was slide. scary. It was yeah. scary. That's a, that must have been difficult after coming out of the castle. But uh, so, you, but you maintain a, a close relationship with Shelley. Yeah, and, and you know, it's I been see, difficult. I know she's suffering from mental illness. She and is suffering she, from mental illness. Yeah. She has uh, she has a lot of demons. Um, um, she lives uh, uh, in Texas again. Okay. She's been living in Texas for a while, and I've. Seen her a couple times when I've gone to South by Southwest. I'll I'll rent a car and go out and see her. Okay. Um, uh, last summer, Dennis Christopher, who oh, was I also in him. the movie, and Dennis, of course, was in Breaking Away. That's and right. Oh my god. He gosh. was in Three Women with Shelley, the Altman picture, which I'm really upset about because I was supposed to be the Coke delivery boy at the end of the movie in Three Women, and but I was doing Between the Lines in yes. New York for yes. Joan Micklin Silver. This was after we had done. Uh, um, Bernice and and uh, I couldn't get back in time, so Dennis got that role oh, and wound up doing five more <laughs> Altman films. But uh, yeah, so Dennis and I went down and visited Shelley last summer, and just oh yeah, she, it's it's hard she's, because she's, she has a lot of demons, but she's a wonderful, she wonderful be, woman. They must have been, she must be in treatment, and so she, right, she's being treated. Mm, no, not she's really, not, not, not that's really. Hard. Why not? That's uh, you don't have to talk about sure. it. Okay, um, but it seems as though she might. And if she, you know, if, if that were the case, she would maybe, you know, it would help quite a bit. If but I'll tell you, you know, when you talk to her, there are some strange things that come out now no about what's going on. But when you talk to her about the movies and that time and 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 all of her fairy tale theaters, oh, right. she remembers every single oh, thing sure. about it. Sure, and, sure. And so, you know, you can have these really wonderful talks about that because right. that was the life, you know. Unfortunately, now there's other things. Yeah. But involved. she could be um, also her career. I mean, yeah. Lord knows that a lot of her contemporaries are working thanks to television, episodic, and uh, yeah. and you know, right? But I mean, I mean you know, Sissy Spacek has probably never been busier. Sissy's and, great, and, but uh, you know, and that's Shelley doing that whole fairy tale theater and then Tall Tales and Legends. I mean, look at the cast she was getting for that. They were all for Mick Jagger, Eric Idle, you know, yes, Vincent Price. I did one of them with Frank Zappa. Vincent Price, Peter McNichol, Dana Hill, Jeff Corey, who's one of the great acting sure. teachers out in L.A. Of course. And, I mean, it was an unbelievable thing. It was, you know, uh, the boy right. who left home to find out about the Shivers. i, I got to catch up on those. Uh, but uh, we are coming close to our, our – we have to leave in a few minutes. So we'll have to de- – we'll definitely have to do a part two, a part two, at least a part two, um, uh, because we're still in Hollywood. Well, we still have we still have fifteen minutes. Which we could just walk there and get there. Yeah. One to three. One minute to before the hour, right? As uh, you know, what I would love to, for you, I've actually I tried to contact Dennis because I would love to get him on the podcast, even if it's over the phone, because um, you know I think he'd be great. Well, you know what? Um, this year is the oh no, fortieth no, anniversary of don't, Breaking Away. Oh my God! And we are going to. Um, I'm bringing him down to. Oh, yeah. I, I work with the Virginia Film Festival in Charlottesville, and uh, I think we're going to bring Dennis and the and and breaking away down f- uh, to do a 40th anniversary screening. So I will definitely talk to him because you know I'll come to the festival. You should come to the festival. Uh, I'll talk to them as well. We can work this out. Okay, because this was one of the. Um, yeah, I don't know if they need jurors or if they just. No, uh, there's no jury. Otherwise, it's not an award yeah. thing. Uh, I, I, or just I would just come as a, you know, a mm-hmm. podcast. I'll come as press or whatever. But because um, um, when is it? When October. Is it? October. Oh, perfect. Okay, October is a good time. Um, yeah, I can't believe that. that was another seminal movie in my that when I watched that just I, I felt I fell in love with Barbara Barry. Oh yeah. Um, he I, was with Barbara a, a couple of weeks she's ago. Still, she's still fine, right? Was she? Um, yeah, it was. It, and and well, I know he he tweeted about seeing Paul Dooley, uh-huh. who played his father, and Barbara was the mother. And right, yeah. I think there was a photo of him and Paul. Actually, he tweeted a photo. I think that, I think that might have been it. Not Barbara. It was Paul. He yes. was with. Yeah. Right. Right. I was uh, for a short time trying to. I was involved with this one festival where we were trying to get her to. You know, come out and make an appearance, and I got pretty close. I had a number of emails. I don't know whatever happened to that, but I was I was so excited the uh, prospect of 
meeting Barbara Barry, who mm-hmm. I, I just adored so much. I just loved her. She actually ended up doing the, the short-lived series, I think, right? Or did they hire a different actress? I don't remember. It was a, it was a TV show. Yeah, no, I remember that. Period of time. I... I don't think Dennis was on that. No. <laughs> they got somebody else. It made a number of careers, that movie, right? Meet Dennis's and, and Dennis Quaid's. Dennis Quaid. And, and, is, and, and, and what's and, his name? Um, the guy who's now in the... Uh, Jamie... Uh, James Earl Haley. James Earl Haley, of course. Was in that one. And yeah. Then, and Daniel Stern. And Daniel Stern was the yeah. fourth. That's great right. Group. I mean, what unbelievable. A great, of course. Yeah. It was even, I don't know if it preceded those. No, I guess it didn't precede, but it was, uh, was it early, one of those teen, you know, coming of age, mm-hmm. right before college, right? And, you know, the townie yeah. versus, is it, there was a number of tropes, but they started with that movie. That's yeah. the difference. You know, it was a great script. What a great script. Mm-hmm. And the whole Italian opera thing. Well, was, and, but, you know, and, it's still, I mean, seventies biking and biking now is right. huge, and breaking away is posters everywhere. I mean, I, I follow Dennis's tweets and I see people from all over the world tweeting him with their bike pictures. Oh and, wow, still, yeah, still, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah, Peter Yates directed that, right? Yeah. Well, there's a whole group also, um, which we call the fanatics, that are uh, <laughs> Jaws two, Jaws and Jaws two fans. Not much three and four, but. I well, mean, those are and the, the fanatics, they're, they're, they're everywhere. I was in Cannes. Oh, 3D, right? I was in, I was in Cannes uh, a month ago walking down the Quasette, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden somebody said, oh, my God, it's Gary Springer, and it's you. Is it really you? And it was one of these Jaws fanatics who, you know, right, they're Cannes. everywhere. I guess. <laughs> but no, no, fanatics, not fanatics. Oh, fanatics now. I fanatics, The fanatics. Yes. Well, it's understandable. I watch it every so often. I'll put on Jaws, and I just, you know, even though it's, it's, it's often blamed, as being the end of the the great new Hollywood period and the beginning of the blockbuster period, which mm-hmm. kind of squelched the you know independent voice in a way, right? right? Well. And and the unique offbeat voice became from there the blockbuster was begat. But um, it, in of itself, it is a uh, it's a it's a very textured, wonderful, beautifully shot, yeah. and and of course the shark is hysterical so you know but we were all scared to go in the water well when we were the first when, movie when we saw. when we were filming um you know we were on sailboats and i was on a catamaran and you know more than jaws one two. more than one time yeah jaws 2 we'd be sailing along and and you know there was a trench out in the gulf of mexico um out where we were we were by pensacola and um just full of hammerhead sharks, mm-hmm. which are the ugliest things known to man. But we'd be, right. you know, we'd be sailing along, and there'd be hammerhead underneath the, between the two pontoons, keeping track. Mm-hmm. And then ten minutes later, we're doing a scene where we're all jumping in the water. So it's like, you know, yes. The scariest thing though was when you jump in the water and you have to swim by the the fake shark mm-hmm. or the R shark, let's say, right. not the fake shark, R shark, and you see that eye underwater. And those teeth, when you're trying to swim through all these cables that, you know, are making it work. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was scary. That was scarier than I swimming bet. with the regular sharks. <laughs> yes, that's right. It, it draws to, uh, again, um, oh, when you had 11 months on that. So yeah. that's, that's incredible, if you think about it. Nobody does that. Well, you know, the first director um, got let go after, like, three months of work. I didn't know that. And it was, uh, then we had a month off. Just to, you know, so we started in we started in March, um, and or started in March April, uh, and finished in. We started up in Martha's Vineyard, then we finished in. Uh, then we went to Florida for months, and then we wound up finishing in Catalina. So we were also, you know, that Catalina was January February. So it was literally like eleven months. Right. Who ended up directing Joe's two? Jano Schwark. And Jano, oh. um, sh- he and Steven Spielberg uh, shared an office. They were they both were doing all of the. Um, I don't. I don't think it was the Twilight Zones. It was. It was one of the Universal TV episodic series that both Steven and Jano were on. Uh, night and, st- and then and then night uh, was this before Jaws? Yeah, no, before Jaws. Did, yeah, yeah. Remember he did Night. Terror, not night. Uh, no, night terror was my movie. Right, no, with right. Valerie Harper. N- yes, I remember. Um, that. But he did another one where it was like he cast yeah. Crawford. Remember, but but Verna Fields um, was Why the the great editor who yes. edited Jaws. She really is was Verna who built Jaws because you know what Stephen shot was kind of a mess from what everybody says, but then Verna put it all together. Right, and then Verna became head of you know one of the heads of production at Universal, and when Jaws two happened and. Um, uh, 
the first director was let go, um, Verna said, you know, wanted Janot to do it because he was he, her, one of her protégés. And Janot said, yes, only uh, if I can make my movie after this. And Janot's only other movie before that bes- besides the... Um, whatever they were. <laughs> yeah, right, right. We'll figure it out. Uh, was a movie called Bug, uh, you know, about bugs. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, bugs, kind of a horror film type right, of thing. Right, right, right. Part so of that's that. why, you know, Jaws 2. But then he went off and, you know, they, they kept to their agreement and he went off and made Somewhere in Time, which is one of the most beautiful movies right. ever. With Christopher, With Christopher Reeve, Reeve yeah. and Jane Seymour. Mm-hmm. And it was a wonderful uh, love story, romantic um, time, time. But that was his deal to make Jaws 2. I see. Uh, well, you were in Jaws, which is, of course, as I mentioned, also, it was like the one of the early big ground, you know, the, 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 obviously the uh, profits were so enormous and yeah. that, that it created this new phenomenon of blockbusters. And uh, and then you were also, since you were in Jaws 2, you were also in the one of the early sequel that, you know, at the time... Uh, there were not oh, yeah, every Jaws big, 2. A movie could be a huge success, but they didn't automatically make a sequel. No, Jaws was, 2 was one of the first, first sequels. was one of those uh, first sequels. Yeah. I mean, Godfather 2, obviously, was yeah. an exception, but Godfather 2 wasn't made in that cynical way as a cash grab. It was right. actually, there was a purpose in the, you know, it was telling an all-new story, And but Jaws 2 was, was, really was, a, 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 to, to a great extent... To, 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 to. Yeah, bankroll on the, uh, of course, the right. success of Jaws. Absolutely. And it did very successfully, as we recall. Yeah. But um, so you have that as a, a, a distinction as well. Being well, look, I, I mean, as I I'm said, I'm not blaming you. I mean, it was uh, two, nobody two of the knew biggest what... movies of the '70s: Dog Day Afternoon and Jaws Two. Sure, you know. Yeah, right. And uh, while well, and, and and during when this period of time when Jaws Two was coming out, what was it '78? Yeah, '79. It was. Uh, you know all those Irwin Allen, uh, big all those movies were also huge at the time. They were all the uh, disaster movies. You know, <laughs> I just want because of Lee, I was going to ask her because Frank Santo Padre, who is the co-host of the Gilbert Godfrey podcast, mm-hmm. he they I had know, yeah, they had Lee on uh, some time ago, and they say he, I said, do any of any pointers for me because we're friendly, and he said, uh, oh, oh, you know, he mentioned a few things. And he said also ask her about the making the swarm. She has some good anecdotes about that. You know, because it was such a one considered one of the worst movies made. Of its day, which you know, one? The swarm. The sw- oh yeah, and it is. I I did watch it, and it, it is horrible, but it's funny too. Oh. As people are getting swarmed, you're it's hysterical. It's just funny to watch them. Well, a lot of those were. I mean, Shelley Winters swimming under. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, but the, you know, in retrospect, but Poseidon Adventure was probably one of the better ones. Yeah. Um, but uh, I I did see it, but I didn't remember to ask Lee because we just had such a nice conversation. It was so intense, and so. It didn't make sense to go to the swarm in the middle of all that, you know. But I, I do want to because I'm so curious. I mean, all these you were working, and we're going to probably have to stop shortly, but for a moment. But you were working at the height of the thing about the '70s, and you see it when you watch like Dick Cavett show and those talk shows, Merv, and all that they would have on all the old Hollywood for still alive and well. Yeah, and majority. working and, and working yeah. still in in whatever. Sometimes TV still in some movies, like like those. Erwin Allen cast a lot of those old. Hall- if you look at the, uh, you know, Olivia de Havilland was uh, was one of the stars of The Swarm. Uh, I mean, I'm just I don't mean to focus on, on that but terrible no, but movie. You're, you're but, right. When but, you look at the, you know, look at the poster. Look at Towering Inferno. Yeah. How, you know, it's it's got one face. Course, Robert after Ryan's yeah. and the, uh, you know, all the great actors. Yeah. You know, or they, and then Henry Fonda would do a walk on. I mean, Henry Fonda was very big in in that. Unfortunately. Well, you, you he, know, he, they would do cash grabs, but. But Robert Ryan, Robert Preston, you know. Yeah, they were terrific, all those guys. But they were also, those were my dad's three best friends, really. It was Henry Fonda, Robert Ryan, and Robert Preston. Wow. So those, yeah, that's, a, good, a good trio to hang out with. I would say so. You're gonna, you Well, Henry Fonda wasn't a drinker, but uh, but we know historically also, maybe a little earlier in his life, that Stuart was his best friend. Yeah. I thought they were best friends. Yeah. Right? At the same time as all those guys, even though they were aging, they were still working you had all the young guys from the new hollywood at the height of that and like all the hip and the rock stars were you know all, they, it was, so all it was like there was all the young new people and all the old ones were still there so right. the 70s is this so the 70s kind of great venn time. diagram Absolutely. of you know of all these amazing people and so that's and so you, that's why i marvel at looking at this especially when you look at the talk shows because they would have on both worlds on the same panel mm-hmm. you know and it was great and it was and, or some of the movies that were mentioning when i moved back to new york uh after living in la and i had i had met 
my wife um, on Martha's Vineyard, where all her friends said, stay away from the most movie people, they're terrible. But she didn't, thankfully, and we wound up uh, living together and getting married and having kids and all sorts of fun stuff. Well, we were oh, talking no. about the whole so anyway, Hollywood, so we the moved back Hollywood. To, we moved back to New York um, eventually because she was not crazy about L.A. And I was working in my dad's office there because she was a teacher of the deaf. And I would get up, at the, you know, she would get up and, and, and go to work. And if I didn't have an audition, I'd go to the beach or hang out. And mm-hmm. finally said, you know, I, I need, Dad, let me come and work in the office, get on the same kind of schedule. And so we did. And after that, I realized I really like working, you know, doing this. And Nancy doesn't like L.A. And I don't really enjoy acting anymore. It's, you know, you really got to want to do that, especially if you're living in L.A. where it's that that's everything. And so we moved back to New York. But one of the uh, one of the movies I worked on when I got back to New York, this is going back to the old actor story, um, was The Whales of August. Oh, sure. Which was the last movie Lillian Gish ever did. Oh, my God. Second to last movie that Betty Davis ever did. Uh, Vincent Price and Southern, and it was you know that those old this is and Southern and Betty Davis in the same movie again. Yeah, that's amazing. And and uh, one of the great stories from that I remember um, I was doing an interview at uh, Miss Gish's home, and it was always Miss Gish. It was you know it could it be Betty, it could be Vincent, but it was always Miss Gish. Um, and we were we were at her house, and she walks in, and I had the, the 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 camera guy and the reporter, you know, the lights all set up in her living room. She walks in and just says, "Camera high, lights low. Camera high, lights low." And then we did the interview, and she you know, this a, is a professional. This is the woman who's been doing it since nineteen since the beginning of film, since the beginning of movies, beginning of the movies. Yeah, and um, the first, afterwards, one of the first afterwards, stars. Uh, you know, when everybody left, she's turned to me and she said. Can I ask you something? I said, of course, Miss Gish. She said, mm-hmm. "That's her." Yeah. Why is she so mean to me? I said, "Oh, Miss Gish, she's not doesn't really mean to be mean." It's, Miss Davis is, you know, is having a lot of problems, but she's so mean to me. <laughs> and I was like, "Here's one of the greatest acting, you know, people of all time," and it's like uh, yeah. pouring her heart out to me in her living room about how Betty Davis. She, how old was she at the time? Lily oh, I, I, I don't know, but it was her. It was her last film. This was like 1987, 88, something oh, like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. So she had to be. Uh, and Betty 80s, did one more after 80s that. Or no, she had to be a, like, push ninety. She, oh, she, she was, lived she over. She was in her nineties. She think, died yeah. close to hundred, right? Yeah, I think she was in her nineties when this happened. Oh my gosh! But um, it's just be, you yeah. know. Uh, more people to fill right, my, right. you know, yeah, yeah. But you're going back to the old actors who were still working like that. It was still that era. Oh my god, well, you have really all gish. those great legends, right. Still doing things, right? I love that. I love that period yeah. because of that reason. Um, well, we're talking to Gary Springer, who is a uh, very well-known publicist and former actor, I guess you'd call you. And we're going to do a part two. I look forward to it. All righty, thanks.